such a privilege to be able to uh, welcome Larry back into our pulpit here. A special privilege for me to welcome him here as my friend today. Larry is one of the uh, few men I consider to be my pastor, along with another one sitting back there. Uh, so Larry, I'm so grateful you've been here to come preach for us. Thank you, brother. <coughs> Well, it's certainly good to be here. We, uh, this, this church means a lot to me, and you'll find more about that later in the message. But um, we, uh, Gary and I left here about 21, 22 years ago and wound up in, uh, in Ahoskie, North Carolina, and uh, we were there for five years, in Siler City, North Carolina. We were there 10 years. We uh, suffered through that for 10 years, and then, <laughs> okay. and then we, this is on tape, and, so, and then we uh, are now in Hampton, Virginia, and uh, the Lord's blessing there, and, and it's so good to be here. Uh, Brother John and I, uh, we met here at this church, uh, the Lord brought us together, and uh, he's just been a dear friend all these years. I say 21, 22 years ago, I'm not real sure, you know, the older you get, the, the Time goes by so quickly, and you're not sure how long you've been anywhere. But <laughs> I think I was here yesterday. But it was, yeah, I think it was 41 years ago. I do know it was about 50 pounds ago. But uh, it, it's good to be back. We were talking before the service, and, uh, and, and what John was referring to, I, I looked to make sure there's no cutout here on the stage. Because uh, several years ago, a friend of mine who used to be a student at Bob Jones University in Greenville, South Carolina, was telling me that uh, they were in chapel one day, and, and on the platform, and I've actually visited the school, and there is, this is true, there is a cutout where the pulpit is. And, and the idea is you can lower the pulpit and the whole deal down to the basement for when they're going to do plays or some, things like that. And during one of the chapel services, you know, in college universities, you have a tight schedule, you mess up the next class hour. So when it came time to end chapel, they lowered that guy right down to the basement. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm glad there's no, I was looking for that here. But there wasn't a basement put in since last time I was here. But uh, anyway, it's good to be here. We praise the Lord for it for this opportunity. Let's open our Bibles this morning to Luke, chapter 15. Some days uh, are more hectic than others for those of you working. For those of you who are retired, sometimes when you retire, you work harder than you did when you worked full time. Amen. Amen. Yeah, amen. Those, those honeydew lists get longer and longer. But it's good to get home in the evening. I, I get home and uh, Karen gets home a little, well, uh, a little while later. It's good to be home with the family. Now, was just the two of us in the family. We had a, a little dog that was part of our family. And she died last Tuesday, this past Tuesday, so while we were gone. So, uh, but we just got the two of us now. But it's good to get home. Good to be home. Uh, how some family situations are not quite as good as others. Um, one husband was complaining to his wife and said, every time I ask you something, you answer my question with another question. And he asked, why do you do that? And she responded, do I really do that? <laughs> one man came in for counseling to his pastor and said, Pastor, I... I think my wife's trying to get rid of me. And he said, well, why do you think that? He said, well, when I get up and get ready to go to work, she always wraps my lunch in a road map. <laughs> well, I told his pastor that, and then uh, he, he realized he went to another couple, and they were celebrating their marital bliss for 60 years. Can you imagine that? 60, anybody here married 60 years or, or older? Well, you may get there one day, some of you. <laughs> Pastor asked, why do they think they uh, come along so well? He discovered they had been married 60 years and had no arguments. You 
Imagine that. Then it was discovered that uh, they were sharing one set of uh, <laughs> one set of uh, earplugs, hearing aids. <laughs> but they never actually heard what the other one was saying. <laughs> Whole life should be joyful, but it's not always joyful all the time. Most of us would have to admit that home life is a blessing, but not every marriage is a blessing. Difficulties come when not everyone in the household is living for the Lord. Sometimes it involves the mate, sometimes it involves the children. But sometimes uh, you'll see either a mate or a child decide they leave at home. And they leave. And leave behind some terrible situations. Same is true in the household of God. Sometimes the children of God decide there's a, there's a better way. And they leave the church. Only to find out later that was not a good choice. Those of us could probably think and don't have to think too long of those who've been here at this church, at all, all churches, who once they, they once loved the Lord and served the Lord and blessed God and, and were faithful in every service, and then we look around and all of a sudden they're missing. They're gone. Um, we've got people on our church roll in our church that uh, the FBI couldn't find. <laughs> They're gone. Where'd they go? What happened? We see here in Luke chapter 15 a parable that Jesus told about a, a certain man who had two sons in verse 11. Verse 12 says, And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. Here's a young man that thought he had a better plan. Wanted to get away from the father. And folks, uh, the primary application of this parable, I believe, is to unsaved people that need to come to Christ and how God's willing to forgive all who come unto him. But there's also an application, I believe, here to those who know the Lord as Savior and for a time turn away and leave the fellowship of God and how God is willing to receive them back if they'll just repent and come back home. I want us to see several things about this this morning. I want us in verses 11 to 16 to see this young man's rebellion. And then in verses 17 through 19, his, his repentance. And then we'll look at verses 20 through 24, the rejoicing of this young situation. This rebellion that took place. Notice verse 12. He says, Give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. The younger man asked for an inheritance. Now under Jewish law, this was acceptable. Uh, in our day, generally all children share equally in the inheritance when the parents pass on. Uh, if there's uh, two or three children, it's divided equally most of the time. Some of you may have children who say, well, I ain't going to give him any. <laughs> but usually, it's divided equally. That has not always been the case, even in this country. While visiting in Indiana, where I am from, I discovered that one of my cousins had done some research on our family tree. And it was discovered that uh, we were related to the wealthy Rothschild family in New England. Also, we're related to the Haviland family, who founded the China Company. These folks were loaded with cash. <laughs> I said, wow, you know, my ship has come in and I'm at the right dock. <laughs> well, reading a little further on, we discovered that uh, custom of that day was when the parents died and went to the oldest. The rest of them didn't get a, didn't get a nickel, so that's, uh, that's where I'm at. <laughs> but in, in Jesus' day, the father could distribute his wealth during his lifetime if he wished. It was legal to do, but it was not very loving. It was like this young man came to his dad and said, Dad, uh, you're just living too long. I'll put my money now. Very unkind. It was 
like saying, I wish you were dead so I could get my money, but since you're still around, I like my money now. It's time for me to leave the house and do my own thing. <clears throat> what he was concerned with was the root problem of his life was covetousness. Looked like a good plan. I'm going to get my money. I'm going to check out of this situation, and I'm going to do my own thing. Now notice verse 13. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. The younger brother left for the far country. Now the far country is not necessarily a distant place. It was far from his heart. And the home. He, his heart was far. He wanted nothing more to do with his family. Rebellion starts in the heart. Mm -hmm. He had left home long before he left physically. His heart was one where I don't want to stay in this house. I've known teenagers just count the days till they turn 18 so they can get out of there. Maybe you've had children like that. They just can't wait to get out from the rules, the regulations. They can't wait from being dragged to church. <clears throat> Rebellion sets in. And it starts in the heart. Children who run away from home even before they're 18 really run away long before they physically leave. And I believe that's what happened to this young man in this story. He rebelled in his heart first. And he ran away from the father and his older brother and lived, uh, and lived a life of sin, it says, doing what he wanted to do. This rebellion in the heart, even for Christians, goes on in our churches today. I've actually had people come up to me, and, and maybe you've had that same situation, uh, brother, where they said, Pastor, we're going to be in church Sunday if nothing else comes up. <laughs> okay. I was preaching a revival one time, or we had a revival in our church, and and uh, somebody came up on Sunday, Sunday morning, it was a Sunday through Wednesday revival, Sunday morning, uh, a lady came up and said, Pastor, we, we're not going to be able to come this week to the revival meeting. I said, really? What's going on? She said, well, our daughter Friday is going to the prom and it's going to take all week to get her ready. <laughs> and I thought, how early is this late? It's going to take you all week to get her ready to go to prom. I, I really, after when I retire, whatever day that is, I'm going to write a book on the excuses that I've received from people who won't be in church on Sunday. It's amazing. Just amazing. But here this young man left home and his father grieved over that. And I believe today that, that uh, children of God, when they leave the home, the church, the fellowship of God, God grieves. Amen. We're told to grieve not the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 4.30. This young man left. But notice in verse 13, he experienced poverty. He wasted his substance. All of this money that his father had given him, he wasted it. He came to nothing. This young man lost all of his money. And then in verse 14, when he had spent it all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Not only was he out of money, then lo and behold, a famine came. He had no money, had no food. He was forced to do, in verse 15, for a stranger that he would not do for his father. He had to get a job. He had to go to work. In fact, in verse 15, notice what he did. He went and joined himself unto a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Now, swine were unclean animals to Jewish people. They couldn't eat him. They couldn't touch him. <laughs> and this young man had to go out and feed these swine. The lowest job as you could get. You see, the thing is, he thought that uh, this life of riotous, riotous living and this sinful lifestyle, that's going to be a blessing. And yet, it turned into a curse. 
Sin may look good, but it doesn't turn out well. He came to a job that he hated, and then not only that, in verse 16, he said uh, he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that have the swine to eat, and no man gave unto him. He became hungry. Sin always promises success, but always delivers failure. Sin promises freedom, but brings slavery. Sin promises life, brings death. The wages of sin is death. I'm reminded of a word of warning from a dermatologist several years ago who said, today's deeply tanned beauties are tomorrow's wrinkled prunes. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's true, but that's, that's what he said. I, I don't know. It's like sin. It, it promises pleasure. And it is fun for a time. But afterwards, it's pure misery. And yet, people choose that kind of a lifestyle. Moses knew that. He knew that sin was enjoyable. In fact, in Hebrews 11.25, Moses chose rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Yes, sin is pleasurable, but there are consequences. Consequences. Consequences not only for unsaved people, but consequences for Christians. Apostle Paul came to the church of Corinth and saw what was going on there, later wrote a letter and said to them what they were doing in the Lord's Supper. They were coming to the Lord's Supper and using it as a drunken party. Paul wrote, and he said, uh, when you come to the Lord's table, you, you're not to come to the Lord's table with sin in your heart. They were. They were making the whole occasion sinful. And he said to them in 1 Corinthians 11.30, For this cause, what cause? Come to the Lord's table with sin in your heart. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Now I know that some people, they get weak. Some Not, not just minded, but some physically weak. That's all a, a part of aging. I fell down the steps the other day at, uh, at Dee's house. Weak. We're weaker today than we were yesterday. The aging process. And I know all sickness is not due to somebody's sin. Uh, sickness has come. And I know that death comes to all. And not everyone who dies, dies because they've committed some sin last weekend. But Paul said there are some who are weak, and there are some who get sick, and there are some who die prematurely because they chose, and like this young man, sin and failed to repent. Many Christians had to learn the hard way. But then the, the story doesn't stop right there. Notice in verse 17, and when he had come to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. There's a, a repentance that takes place. And, and sometimes people, and, and including Christians, have to reach bottom before they repent. <coughs> Sad. And sometimes parents whose child has uh, wandered off to home and, and wandered off to live in sin, they find themselves, as this young man did, in destitution with, with no money, nothing to eat. And the first thing the parents do is write them a check. There you go. But folks, think about this. Until they reach bottom, they may not ever come out of that mess. Now, I've told my children that you're always welcome to come back. Things get tough, but I'm not writing checks. I do. But if they come back, there's rules they got to live by. You know, we're going to church. You live here, we're going to church. You don't want to go to church, don't live here. 
<laughs> Simple rule. This young fella came to repent. He changed his mind. He thought back about how life used to be back home with Dad. And you know, Christians, sometimes when they reach bottom, they're reminded of how good they had it back at the church. That's a place where people actually love them. Nobody loved this fellow back in, in, in this town. He had to get a job. Had to go out there and work with swine. The church is a place where people, I have found, love you. Amen. He changed his mind about being a sinner. He changed his mind about his sin. He changed his mind about his father. He remembered that his father was a generous man. He didn't have to want for anything back home. And that's the way it is with you and I. When, when we're called to go through trials and tribulations, we're not going through those by ourselves. God's with us. I don't know whether you know it or not, but some churches are, are just mean churches. <laughs> Anybody ever gone to a mean church? <laughs> I mean, they are. Like I said, I went to one church for 10 years and, uh, you know, we survived. <laughs> I pastored a church down in Suffolk, Virginia. Uh, mean as snakes there. <laughs> I'll be honest with you. I tell them to their face. They do mean. Yet, when we call to go through those tough times, God's always there. And if you're out of fellowship with God, you're going to perish in that situation. If you're not in the ministry, you'll perish in the situations unless you've got a God who loves you in close fellowship and a church family that loves you. You're not going to make it. But he changed his mind and he said, I'm going home and I'm going to tell him I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Genuine repentance. He said, I'm going to tell him I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Verse 20, he arose and came to his father. But when he is yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion. And notice here, as our brother said the other night, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. He didn't have to go beg. He had planned to beg his father. Forgive me, I've sinned against you, and I just make me a servant. He didn't even get through with his speech. The father ran to him, hugged him, and kissed him. And, and we see here there was a celebration that took place. Verse 22, the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, not just any old robe, the best robe, put it on him, put a ring in his hand, showing authority, and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf, kill it, and let's eat and be merry. They had their own homecoming right there. Okay. He says, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. That is a picture, folks, of our Heavenly Father and the joy in heaven when one sinner repents. Amen. Unsaved person comes to, to the Lord. There's rejoicing in heaven and, and there's going to be a, a party in heaven one day when we're with the Lord. But it's also a picture, I believe, of that Christian who strays from the precepts of the Word of God and turns his back on the Father and lives in sin and then repents. And sometimes I, I've, I've known of people that have come to me, Pastor, I, I don't think that the Father will ever receive me back. I've done too many things. I have, and they've listed whatever they've done. God would never receive me back. I point him to this passage because this is the heartthrob of the Father in heaven to receive a sinning Christian back. We, we think that... Uh, of course, God's not pleased with a sinner, uh, a Christian who goes out and lives in sin, but He never stops loving them. Amen. Never gives up on them. It's the heartbeat of God to to get them to come back home. Sometimes He has to bring He has to bring chastisement and spank His children to get them to repent and come back home. But God's desire is to receive them back. That's right. 
You might be here today as one of those who, maybe in your heart, you've left home. Well, you come to church occasionally. But in your heart, you just assume that you're home, sleeping in. It's just not right. Something's wrong in your life. And you once served the Lord faithfully, loved God with all your heart, and now just, just cold and, and indifferent things of God. You're on a path of gradually leaving the Lord. That's right. Not losing your salvation, but folks, it'll seem like it. I've never told this story to more than a handful of people. I'm going to tell you what, what happened in my life, because I can relate very well to this. <coughs> Back uh, Many years ago, 27, 26 years ago, I worked for the Bible Broadcasting Network where they were located in uh, Chesapeake, Virginia. I've been there eight years. I also pastored that mean church in Suffolk, Virginia for a year. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, it and that situation caused my family life to disintegrate. Mean churches will do that to you, brother. I'm thankful this is not one of them. But uh, the family fell apart. I left the ministry. And even today, this past week, we went to a Bible conference in Cary for pastors. And uh, one of the people there remembered my name from being on the Bible Broadcasting Network 27 years ago. But I left and I came here to the Outer Banks. Found an ad in the newspaper in uh, the Virginia Pilot. Wanted news director, WBOD. <coughs> I said, okay. I've had a radio background, worked in secular radio, worked in Christian radio for a number of years, in addition to pastor. I applied, got the job. So I moved to the Outer Banks and lived not far from the radio station and really a hut. All I could afford. Two rooms and a bathroom. Well, I started working. The first week ended. And lo and behold, the station manager quit. Went to work for Ken. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> <Does that affect? laughs> and uh, the owner came to me and said, you know, most experienced guy we got on the staff. Would you mind filling in as the station manager till we get somebody? I said, well, yeah, okay. Didn't pay anymore. <laughs> you know how some, you know, promotions get. You change your title on the door, but that's about it. <laughs> and uh, so I did that, and they never did find anyone else till I left. But the, the story behind all that is I got mad at God. I was living for the Lord. I was pastoring the church. I was working in Christian radio, doing it all right, I thought, and the bottom fell out. I said, God, how could you do this to me? I wound up in Mantio working at WBOD back in, uh, what was it, the late 80s, I guess it was. And I was on the air a lot, not only doing the news, but as a station manager, and Kim can relate to this, when you have to fire somebody, somebody quits, or somebody gets sick, or on vacation, you got to fill in on the air. So I found myself on the air in the morning. I was there five years. I was the morning announcer for three of those five years. And Kim and I were opposite each other. He was on the radio at the same time I was. The only difference is he had better radios. <laughs> But I got mad at God. And for two years, I never went to church. I never opened a Bible. I allowed sin to come into my life. And I was done with God. Maybe you're here and that's happened to you. Inwardly. But I outwardly. I, we had two secretaries. Uh, we had a secretary, the office manager. And we had the lady that... Uh, wrote the commercials and scheduled the commercials. Both were Christians. God always leaves a Christian witness 
They didn't want me to go to church with them. They went to different churches. So I went to church with one, and I went to church with the other one. And I sat there, and God was speaking to my heart. This is what I need. I need to get back in church. But I'm still mad at God. Well, one time, that's it. But I ain't going to get into that again. I had it in church. Well, uh, Thanksgiving came, as it does every year about this time. <laughs> And I, I found out that my two youngest children wanted to come and spend Thanksgiving with me. Oh boy. Now, my situation was, I didn't have any money. Radio doesn't pay anything. Ken found out that later than I did. Yeah. I literally, having nights for my supper was, was uh, microwave popcorn. It's all I could afford. Some nights I, I elevated up to spaghetti, but I couldn't afford ragu to put on it. So I just put a little salt and pepper on there. Now my kids are coming. What am I going to serve them for Thanksgiving? I might be able to get some ragu to put on that spaghetti. <laughs> so I was going through the Coastland Times one day that week. Big full page ad, Wharf Restaurant, free Thanksgiving dinner for those who can't go anywhere, have no family, can't do anything, can't cook. Just come on down to Wharf Restaurant. Mm. That's, that's what we're doing. <laughs> so I showed up Thursday morning, and uh, that's where we went. Now, I did not know the owner of the Brent Wharf Restaurant was a Christian. I believe that's closed down now. The Wharf Restaurant's gone. But we went in there, and that place was just packed with freeloaders. I was one of them, my joke. And that fella got up, and people just seated at their tables, and that fella got up on the table in the back, the owner of the place, and said, now, I want you all to understand that this free meal is my way of thanksgiving to God for a great year. He's blessed me financially this year, and I want to get back to him, and I'm giving this meal to those in need. And before we eat, I'm going to have a word of prayer. And in that prayer, God broke my heart. Just to pray. I sat through two church services. But that man's prayer broke my heart, and... And I repented in my heart. It took some time to get back into complete fellowship with the Lord, but that's where it started. You don't know what one person, what you as an individual can do to retrieve somebody from coldness of heart. Just this man's prayer. It was not a grandiose prayer. It was just a prayer of thanksgiving for God's blessing and like this young man, I remembered the blessings of God back when I served him. Long about that time, Karen came along. We started dating and talking on the phone. We talked for hours at a time. She invited me to this church. So I came. And I found a group of loving, warm people. And literally, they love me back to fellowship with God. And I'm thankful for that. Amen. Karen and I were married here in 1991. Uh, this building was not finished yet. It was almost finished. And it was really December that year. It was before Christmas. They got it done. We got married in May. And, uh, or in, in the July, rather. And we had to go down the street to another church to get married. But uh, this church was just such a blessing, a blessing to me, <clears throat> loving people. Now, I don't know if you've had such a drastic situation in your life, but I have in my life, and I know what it's like to live apart from God, and it is not pleasant. I know even better how pleasant it is to live for God. To be where God has called me to be. God used this church 
to speak to my heart to get me back in the ministry. And we served the Lord from that time forward. 21 years ago we left here. And uh, this is my first time back to preach in 21 years here. I appreciate the opportunity. But if you're here today and maybe your heart has just become cold to the things of God. Not the same as it used to be. Today is the day to get back. That's right. Heavenly Father is just ready to wrap His arms around you and love you. And heal you of your hurts and your pains. God never held it against me that I was mad at Him. He loved me anyway. Amen. And, and I'm grateful for that. But if you're here today, cold and indifferent, to get your heart right with the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you've never trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Maybe today you realize that you might even be a church member somewhere, but you're just, just not saved. Today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. Come to Christ. Live for Him. He'll bless you and minister to you and heal you of hurts and sorrows and be the one that's there with you step by step when you go through dark days. Amen. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Father in heaven, we're thankful today for Jesus, the one who died for us. We're thankful today that there is that one that sticks us closer than a brother. In our times of difficulties and problems, even those times when we get mad at God, Lord, we're thankful that you really never get mad at us. You grieve, but you still love us. The arms are always open to that sinner, that even Christian, who leaves home and comes back into the presence of you. Lord, may there be those today who, hurting inside, come back to you. May we see thy Holy Spirit work in hearts and lives today and restore fellowship one with another, with you and with other brothers as well. And we'll thank you for what you do in our hearts. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Brother, would you come? <coughs> Brother Larry, thank you for your word. As our trio is coming this morning and our band, we're going to have our invitation hymn. I think I said about the same thing last night, but just a quick reminder. This is not simply a way to close a service. We do this as an important, in fact, a necessity, a means. God speaks to people through His Word. If you're like me, you've probably questioned why. I mean, why doesn't He do it another way? He wrote on the wall one time pen with a hand and no arm. He's spoken from the heavens. People have heard it. Why doesn't he do that? I, I can't answer that. But I can say that the Bible says that it pleased God that by the foolishness of preaching to save people. Amen. So he speaks through his word. So we sit through a service like this and God's at work. You may or may not feel him, but he's at work because he's faithful. Bottom line is he's spoken something to you today. Uh, you, you, you feel something. You, you become confident about something. You've been persuaded of something that you've been toying with in your mind. That's God. He's spoken. And what he asks for is a response. If you don't respond to him, it's the same thing that happens when a telemarketer calls and you hang up on him. Click. That's a good thing there. It's not a good thing with God. All he's asking for is your response. You're not going to have to do anything at all today to get in his favor. You're not going to have to promise him anything to deserve what he'll do. Step number one is just say yes. <laughs> and then he comes in and he'll take over. While they sing today, this is a time to have a private minute in a public place, you come. You tell God yes. Say, well, what next comes? And there's no telling. 
Step one is respond. So I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet while they sing this morning. God's speaking to you. Please don't put it off. I'm going to ask you to come kneel at the front somewhere. If you need someone to pray with you, there's plenty.